Folks, this is Patrick Tarleton. Um, I'm the executive director of the Texas Deer Association. I am here with Charlie Seal, the executive director of the Exotic Wildlife Association here in Texas. We have an action-packed webinar for you today. We're really excited to bring something a little different to you. Uh, we're going to talk with Charlie about the history of exotics in Texas, the economy right now, the economic impact, ways to improve your ranch's profitability, um, diversification of species on your ranch, and habitat management. We've got a lot to cover today. We're going to start with a PowerPoint that Charlie's put together just about um, an overview of exo the exotic industry um, in Texas and across the country, how they got here, um, um, what they mean to Texas, what you can do on your ranch to, um, to make it more profitable and, and, and to diversify your wildlife on the ranch. And then we're going to move into a question and answer. So um, we're going to start here right promptly at noon. Uh, that's in about four minutes from now. Uh, we're going to make sure that you, we're going to outline everything that's on the screen so that people on the phone can hear as well. We know many of you call in, so we're going to make sure we're, we're thorough in our explanation of any graphics or anything that's on the screen. If you have questions, please make sure that um, you either text my cell phone or email my, uh, my email account at patrick at texasdeerassociation.com if you're on the phone. Or if you're online, you can always just go to your GoToWebinar control panel, scroll down to questions, and enter a question there, and it'll pop up on the screen. Charlie and I can get it answered for you. So again, we're going to do an overview, and then we're going to jump right into Q&A. Uh, as always, we always get this question right off the bat. And that is, we are recording this webinar. We will post the recording a couple days from now, if not tomorrow, uh, so that you can review just in case you aren't able to hear everything or you have to jump to another meeting. So again, with that, um, Charlie, let, let's just test a little bit of sound. Are you there? Can, can, can you say a few words just real quick to introduce yourself? Yeah, Patrick, I, I hear you fine, and I'm hoping uh, everybody can hear me, and I, I want to thank the Texas Deer Association for uh, the opportunity inviting us to do this webinar today. And, uh, you know, I think uh, with COVID-19 for the last few months, uh, our meetings have become mostly virtual these days. We're hoping we get out of that soon so we can uh, at least see some of our friends again. We're looking forward to all the conventions this summer. So uh, with that, uh, whenever you're ready to go, Patrick. Okay, let's... Uh... Let's uh, wait about just two more minutes here to let folks uh, pile on uh, to their to either the phone number or the webinar online. Charlie, I'm going to do our shameless plugs here. I don't I don't mind doing it at all, folks. If you have not been to the Exotic Wildlife Association annual meeting uh, or or, or um, the, their summer bash, I think it's actually the congressional fundraiser. Isn't that what it is, Charlie? It is, and it's the first weekend of August, uh, Patrick. We planned that around uh, the TDA convention and also the Deer Breeders Corporation convention at the latter part of August, so there would be no conflict. So we're hoping that everybody will attend all three of those conventions if you have an opportunity to do that. Uh, we're at Tapatio Springs, uh, same place we were in, in February for our annual membership meeting. And uh, it's a, if, that is a, if you haven't been out there, it's a brand new, uh, after they burned a few years ago, it's a brand new facility and it's absolutely beautiful. And uh, it's a good place to bring the kids, especially before they start back to school. Folks, if you haven't been out to the congressional fundraiser out there, if you weren't able to make the annual meeting at Tapatio Springs, it, it's really a joy out there. You're gonna have a lot of fun. Um, it, it's the largest collection of exotic breeders in the country. There's nobody even close to to doing what Charlie and EWA does. You really need to get out there. If you're new in the business or you're thinking about putting exotics on your land, um, you, you can you can glean a lot of information from that, that show. Not only do they have a fundraiser where they're raising money for um, federal advocacy, but they, federal and state advocacy, but they also um, have a lot of informational meetings where you can sit and talk with some people that have been in the business for a long time, or you can sit and talk with Charlie or any of their board members. Um, I, I don't mind plugging him because I love him so much. If you if you want to talk to somebody in state government, Commissioner Tommy Oates will be there. Tommy is a commissioner of the Texas Animal Health Commission, and he's always there, and he's always great to talk to. Uh, 
he'll be able to fill you in on all the stuff that's happening at the Texas Animal Health Commission as well. So it's worth going, folks. It's right the weekend before TDA. Um, if you have not made August plans, you're in luck. We, the, the deer and exotic industry has you at three of the best resorts in the Central Texas area. You start at Tapatio Springs with DWA. You go the next week to the JW Marriott with TDA. And the last weekend on August is at the Hill Country, uh, the Hyatt Hill Country Resort there in San Antonio again for the DBC. So you don't have to leave Texas to get your vacations in. We're excited to have everybody. All three organizations are, are, are in unison and in lockstep about how we protect this industry um, and our members in it. And so come out to one, if not all of those events to make sure you're supporting the, the, the industry associations. Charlie, with that, we've got about 55 people on now. Um, let's go ahead and roll. We had more than 100 registers, so I know we're going to I know we're going to pick people up as we go. I see people um, chiming in right now, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, everybody who's on the computer ought to see a history of exotic of the exotic industry in Texas slide. It's the title slide. We're going to allow Charlie to introduce himself and then we're going to roll um, right into this PowerPoint. Charlie will be able to see slides on his end as well. And Charlie, if you'll just tell me, change the slide when you're ready, um, we'll go ahead and kick this off. So Charlie, why don't you go ahead? All right. I appreciate it, Patrick. Again, thanks to uh, the Texas Deer Association for uh, inviting us to do this. Uh, history of the exotic industry and uh, the explosion of the exotic industry in Texas. Um, this uh, this PowerPoint we put together is uh, it's going to be a little it's about a three year old PowerPoint. So there's going to be some of the information that we'll update as we go through it. Uh, this was presented. Uh, we were invited to South Africa uh, about three years ago to to give this presentation over there at their uh, it's their equivalent to our convention. Uh, their wildlife ranching of South Africa, and so that's how we put this thing together. So, Patrick, if you bring up the first slide, we'll we'll begin it. That's I don't think that's the first slide, Patrick. <clears throat> oh, uh, Charlie, that's the one I got. I'm sorry. That's a that's okay. Well, let's just go on with that. Let's talk about just a little bit about the uh, economic impact uh, that. Back in 2007, um, as you can see, the uh, Texas A&M University did an economic impact of, of several of the industries and uh, the exotic industry as well as the whitetail and the elk industry. Um, just in Texas, uh, the exotic industry at that time was $1.5 billion industry. And we're guessing today that that is gonna be closer to probably a $2 billion uh, industry. And they divided that almost equally. It was about 650 million of that was in the hunting end of it, or the breeding end of it. 850 million was in the uh, hunting side of it. And then when you combine secondary impacts such as the fuel feed and vehicles and things like that, that uh, everybody uses, the total economic impact estimated at that time in the exotic industry was 3.3 billion. Um, the exotic industry had a very meager and a humble beginning. Uh, it doesn't look, back then, it didn't look anything like it does today. And uh, the icons of the industry could never envision what the uh, industry would evolve into in 2020. Pull the next slide, Peter. The first exotics in Texas, <clears throat> we were able to trace these back and I'm sure that a lot of the people that are in and around the hill country that are on today know where Camp Purdy is. The first non-native species was introduced in 1854 when the Secretary of War petitioned Congress for $30,000 to purchase uh, about 100 or 33 camels. And uh, the first camels arrived from Egypt. Uh, there was 33 of them. A second load in 1857 came. There was 40 of them. And by the end of the of the war, there were more than 100 camels and uh, here in Texas at Camp Verde. And that what they use those camels for is to transport supplies from San Antonio to the various military bases uh, all the way to El Paso. And because of budgetary cuts and things like that, they had to pull the camels and pull the program. And what they did, they just let the camels loose. And uh, it was a, the experiment was abandoned. 
and it was nothing to see camels rolling freely around Texas for many, many years after that. So that was kind of the first exotics that uh, we will will call it here in Texas. Next slide. Uh, the beginning of the actual exotic industry, you know, and it's, it was in the forties and fifties, a lot of the ranchers, uh, domestic livestock prices and the severe drought of the, of the fifties was taking its toll. And many ranchers were forced to sell their property and take jobs in the, into, into town. And, you know, whitetail deer leases back then was a seasonal income. And there were several ranchers <clears throat> back then that, uh, who I would call visionaries in the industry. They, um, they had been on African safaris. People like, uh, uh, the Shriners, um, uh, Charlie the Third, uh, Dale Prio, um, uh, some of those guys, they had, they knew that the Texas Hill Country was almost identical to South Africa. And they felt like that those animals that were found in Africa could be grown and bred right here in, in the Hill Country. And uh, so they, uh, they, they, once they established uh, a, a rapport to Zimbabwe, and those Antonio and the San Diego Zoo, they would give their surplus <clears throat> to the ranchers. They let them buy them or give them. And that's how the first established uh, got into, into a bunch of, and, uh, as a result, <clears throat> they they started those money to regulate them. They were allowed year round. And uh, it was it was a kind of a novelty back in back then, so people could tell animals that were found in Africa without ever going there. Next slide. <coughs> in the years, uh, like I said, staff were willing to sell or give their animals away, and, and of course, you know, all day had to move flying bar, those sheep, and the course guns, they adapted, I mean, readily adapted to the Texas Hill Country. And Axis, Black Buck, Fallow, and uh, the things that <clears throat> were all over the Texas landscape. Floods, as, uh, once the rain started again, water gaps washed out. These animals escaped, and that's how and we have such a great population, a tremendous population of free-range exotics uh, that are found on most of most any ranch here in the Hill Country. And uh, as as more and more hunters experience these strangers on the range, they developed an appetite for longer and longer hunting seasons. And because, like I mentioned, they were not native to Texas, so there was no hunting regulations placed on them, and uh, they could be hunted year round. And so, it's quickly provided, uh, and in many instances, saved Family Ranch uh, from having to be sold because there was an annual income rather than just from the uh, hunting of whitetail. Next slide. As time progressed, they need to have bigger, more, uh, more animals than just those common exotics that we, we think about. Um, ranchers started breeding uh, Attic, Sable, Kudu. Um, the Thompson gazelle, springbok, many, many of these these larger animals. They were, and the challenge was that they they just could not take care of themselves by themselves. They were there was a lot more um, effort put into these animals, and that's when the new term super exotics uh, was. Uh, and of course, the cost on those animals were were a lot higher than what the commons were, and um, so. Uh, the Texas landscape became, there's also free ranging super exotics out there. The Texas landscape was in, in, was absolutely filling up with non-native species. And kind of like the old um, wars between the cattle and sheep people, there was a, a lot of bitterness towards some of the cattle, uh, on some of the cattle guys because of these, uh, these animals, non-native animals that were allowed to roam freely. and and got off other ranches. Next slide. In uh, the, the beginning of our association, we actually started in 1967, and we'll be celebrating our 54th uh, year in, uh, at our annual membership meeting next year. But 
Um, the hunting and breeding of exotics are doing a big business in the state. And uh, like I said, it, it absolutely saved many of the family ranches from devastation. And it was becoming so lucrative that some of the ranchers soon sold off their domestic and raised nothing but exotic animals on the land. Uh, it was at the very start that the, the sheep and goat fencing, which was four feet, a net wire. It would be adequate, obviously, for some of the species, but the vast majority of the species, it would not contain them. In those days, there was no eight foot uh, wire, uh, or even 10 foot wire. And so what these, uh, these ranchers did is they just, they put two four foot fences, one on top of the other, and were very um, clean. And, but you know what they did, they, they were able to raise these animals and keep them within inside. Uh, but many of them, you know, especially where they were joined at the, uh, in the middle, uh, those animals could, if they hit that wire, could bust right through them. So a lot of escapes days. But uh, that led to a whole new industry later on with the invent of eight foot and 10 foot wire. And um, what happened in the in those days is, and I think you will find that on the next, uh, next slide, Patrick, um, is that the, go ahead and flip over. Charlie. So, but the, in order to stay, yeah, I'm here. In order to stay out from under the regulations of, of the the uh, agency, the the Texas ranchers felt like that the uh, the only association out there that really protected uh, the livestock was the Texas and Southwestern cattle raisers. And um, again, there was a lot of bitter feelings for these uh, these strangers on the range and. They I use the owner of an arrow uh, branch is uh, he was instrumental in going to the agri going to the legislature and getting the exotics placed uh, as a, as exotic livestock in the uh, agriculture code. And so what that did was it it was the it would they would fall not a wildlife but they would fall under the Texas Animal Health and that would be regulated on just like the domestic livestock. And um, and so this is where they still remain today. And I, I think we're very fortunate to have, you know, president of our association sitting on the Animal Health Commission because it, it does uh, uh, the service industry, not just the exotic industry, but it gives the service industry uh, a voice in regulations. I mean, more and more evident that uh, that the livestock, traditional livestock industries were not going to protect um, our interest in the exotic world. So um, a group of, of the icons again, uh, Charlie Schreiner and Mike Hughes and Del Prio started what was known at that time as his Wildlife Association. And uh, it never had more than a few members back in those days. And but it managed to have a great presence in the Texas state legislature. And 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 they were very successful in achieving many of the rules and regulations that the industry is still under today. And exotic industry still struggles in many counties today. And that's because of ag valuations. And, and some of you on this webinar today may you know, live in one of those counties that they don't totally recognize uh, ex exotics uh, for an ag valuation on your ranch. But that there's fewer and fewer of those as we uh, educate uh, these, these folks. And uh, we're gonna be facing just so you know, in, in 2021 in the legislature, we're gonna be facing some issues on taxing, sales tax on some of these exotics and um, and even some of the other livestock. And we're gonna to try to work on that with, uh, with some of our legislators uh, because there's a conflict under the Ag Code and under the state comptroller's regulations on what exactly is food and fiber. So this is something that's gonna to have to be answered and, and, and worked out. And um, taxes on the hunting operation, uh, taxes on those, we've struggled. But again, our presence in the legislature has helped hold off, uh, you know, the so-called wolf at bay um, for the time being. But these are issues that, that uh, you're going to be hearing about from, from the Deer Association as well as EWA um, on, as we try to fix these, these tax problems that we have. Next one, Patrick. 
Uh, our motto, as most of you know, is conservation through commerce. You give an animal a value and it's going to flourish. And many of the animals that, uh, that, that we raise were threatened in their native land or are extinct, but they flourish here. And why is that? It's again, through conservation, through commerce. Um, the other agricultural industries certainly learn this concept, but getting those individuals in the U.S. Department of Interior to uh, who enforce the Endangered Species Act, that was, that was an act of, I mean, just absolute, uh, like pulling teeth. And what we were able to do back uh, in 05 and 06 was show the numbers that we had to do a census count. And we were able to to show them and actually brought some of their attorneys from the Department of Interior down to Texas. We met at the Wyo Ranch, we met at uh, the Prio Ranch and some of the others and showed them the, these three species, they became known as the Attix, the Dama Gazelle and the Scimitar Horn Orcs. We showed them how they're extinct in the in their native lands, but there was at that time there was well over eleven thousand of those animals, and that's just in the scimitar horn uh, census. Uh, and um, they were they went back. That was under the George H. W. Bush administration. They went back to Washington and wrote an exemption for those three species to where they did not fall. They were exempted from the requirements of the Endangered Species Act. And of course, as you can imagine, they were we were promptly sued over that and um, that wound its way through court for almost five years and we finally lost the exemption lost the lawsuit lost the exemption and uh, and then we came back and wrote and had a congressional mandate and it was written into a uh, and under the obama administration uh, it was attached to a interior uh, appropriations bill and because there is no line item veto, it was able to slide through and along with that appropriations bill, and we were the rest is history. Uh, so these these three species are, as you know, they're they're exempt from the um, requirements of the ESA. And that, that was about a half a million dollar um, project to get that done through the court system and through the uh, the legislature, the congressional mandate. And right now, today, we've got seven more that we're working on up there. And uh, the bill that has been written is in committee. And as soon as we can get our Congress to quit impeaching our president and get back to business, if they ever do, we hope to get that one through sometime this either early fall or next year. Uh, next slide, Patrick. The future of the exotic industry. Uh, we believe, and I, I think many of you who are on this uh, webinar know, is it's it's very bright. Uh, as more and more regulatory requirements are forced on the native wildlife breeders, we are seeing a trend of more and more diversification within the exotic industry. Uh, those that many years ago, when we first started attending the the Texas Deer Association convention, there were a lot of purists that that did not care anything about, it, and there's still some today that don't like the exotics. But there's less and less, and they would have. There were many who would have never considered exotics in the past. Are now seeing that the diversification of their ranching uh, uh, that they do is 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 they're losing money if they if they haven't diversified and and offer their hunters uh, something else, or even if you're not a hunting ranch, have something else to offer and sell throughout the year. And I think that you're going to continue to see. Um, uh, I know a lot of folks uh, in our organization who are whitetail breeders have have uh, either sold out or or um, and, and gone strictly to exotics because of because of over over regu uh, over regulation within the native uh, breeding markets. And uh, so, you know, with that, Patrick, I think that's probably just about where we're at. Um, uh, to sum it up and. Uh, we joined the very last thing we did, and this is, was primarily aimed at South Africa, was the uh, Rhino Project. Uh, we have hit stumbling block after stumbling block. We were able to, we, some of our members do have these, uh, the rhinos here in Texas, um, but it is, it's because of CITES, um, the, the program that they have is, it's, and the 
political atmosphere in South Africa is absolutely, it's devastating, uh, the Rhino project. And, um, you know, they're losing three to five a week over there. And there's only about 25,000 uh, rhinos left in Africa. And it's, uh, we were hoping to have a safe deposit box here in Texas. And it's not totally out of the realm of possibility, but uh, it's, it looks very bleak uh, for the future. And it's, it has to do with politics. And that's, and that's a sad issue. And having said that, Patrick, I think that's my, I think that's all of it. Uh, the rest of it was just a, a thank you to our South African friends. Like I said, this was a presentation to them. So I will conclude with that, Patrick. Charlie, we've got a lot of questions um, coming through. First, can you talk a little bit more about the economic impact of exotics in Texas? Just um, give, give us another summary and rundown of that, please, sir. Say that again, Patrick. I lost just a little bit of it. No problem. Um, we've got a lot of questions about the economic impact. Just a couple questions. Um, can you run over the economic impact in Texas one more time for us? Yeah, the, the 07, and I'll just allude to those numbers, Patrick, that they get. It was uh, $650 million, or $650 million on the breeding side of it, and $850 on the, $850 million on the um, hunting side which was uh, about $1.3, $1.4 billion industry. And when you combined all of the secondary um, things like fuel and, and things like that, uh, we, we believe today that it's up uh, to about $2 billion in the exotic side of it. Now that 3.3 billion that was on the screen earlier, uh, that had to do with the, the whitetail as well as the uh, exotic industry, and, ju and that's just in Texas, and uh, that's probably going to be more up around four billion dollars now if you combine it all. Okay, uh, next question is, now I'm gonna I'm gonna jump just real quick to um, a real specific question. It says, which seven exotics are proposed to be added in the in the Three Species Act? It will be, and I, <clears throat> I'm gonna sit here and try to number them. It's uh, the Els deer the Barasinga, the Red Lechwe, the Gravy Zebra, the Arabian Oryx, the Bangtang, and the Gower. Those are, those are the seven. Okay. Um, ne next question I, I, I wanna ask, Charlie, uh, just because I, I, I want folks to know, can you kind of outline what's going on in your federal advocacy right now? Um, I, I, I want people to be real clear um, and state advocacy. I want to include both um, that, that you guys do put on sales, but one of your main mission and and and, and um, one of your main mission and goals is to ensure that live animal transactions of exotic species are protected here in the United States. Can you talk a little bit about what's going on at the federal level, and then again about the sales tax, maybe go a little bit more into depth on the sales tax discussion here at the state. Okay, well at the federal level, we do have a, <clears throat> the EWA does uh, have a federal lobbyist, and um, and he was responsible, uh, and, and we won't take total responsibility for it, but because we worked with others such as Dallas Safari Club and Safari Club International on, on that issue, and, um, but, we were in the end, uh, we were able to successfully get those three done. We now tried the seven, uh, and, and one of the <clears throat> things that uh, we're running into is there's a, with this COVID-19, Patrick, there has been uh, a mood um, to shut down the Asian wet markets. And there's a bill currently, there's, well, there's a couple of bills. But there's a bipartisan bill that's being worked on by our senator, which uh, is uh, John Cornyn, and also one of the unlikely senators that would be working with him is Cory Booker. And um, it's it's a I mean it's a terrible terrible bill that as we're seeing it, and we've we've had some input and and thanks to the uh, Texas Deer Association and Deer Breeders Corporation, as well as uh, the Elk Breeders Association, um, we sent letters, all of us sent letters to Senator Cornyn, uh, voicing our opposition to some of the language that was in that bill. And they, they, for the most part, have changed a lot of that. But what it would do was actually 
give our U.S. Fish and Wildlife, our USDA APHIS, and the U.S. Geological Survey would give them the ability to decide what animals being transported uh, across state lines or across international lines. And we do have a lot of an international market, especially with elk coming from Canada, would if there was a that they had a disease that could be transmitted to people then they would um they could stop the, the entire movement of those animals from you know that you'd have nothing but intrastate movement and there'd be no interstate movement um that's the the specific wording in one paragraph of that bill and that's what all of our letters did and it has now exempted um the language currently exempts, if it goes through like that, exempts uh, cervids that are captive, captive barn cervids uh, within the U.S. And um, the rest of that bill is just fluff. Uh, I think it's aimed at uh, the Asian markets are not going to listen to what the U.S. says. They're not, they, they can care less about a bill over here. But it's a dangerous bill from the standpoint that they can determine if, uh, you know, it has potential even on domestic livestock for that for that matter, um, from tuberculosis to brucellosis to anything else that could possibly be passed to humans. And so that's why we 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 just could not go without without voicing our opposition to that. And and Senator Cornyn listened to us. Yeah, I want to I want to make um, I want to make sure uh, sure our, our our listeners understand. Folks, without EWA and their federal advocacy program, um, we we were notified at the Texas Deer Association. I was by Charlie and um, Mr. John Blunt, who's their lobbyist up there about this. And we are not in the habit of of going against John Cornyn. John Cornyn is a dear friend of ours, but some of the language that he had would have been tremendously harmful if used by the wrong people. And to, to kind of sum up what Charlie said, it, it would have allowed... Um, the Department of the Interior and other federal agencies to um, just autonomously pick which species they could restrict movement on. And um, while we may have a good relationship now with some of those agency and administration bureaucracies, um, you never know what the future holds. And so we, we didn't want to give rulemaking authority uh, to an agency like that, where in 90 days they could restrict the movement of any animal that we currently have the ability to transport. And so, Charlie, kudos to you and John and, and everybody involved in the process for getting TDA and others involved, especially NAVA, the North American Elk guys involved um, in, in getting this language changed. It was it was a good cooperative effort, and we appreciate you getting us involved. If you don't mind, well, and, and, and... Well, one one additional thing, Patrick, on that is like you like you mentioned, Senator Cornyn has, has always been our friend. He's always listened to us, and uh, and I don't think he really he had really read and and understood the ramifications of that particular uh, that particular uh, part paragraph in the, in that bill, and uh, and he was more than happy to pull that out and rewrite that as as soon as we brought that to his attention, and. Uh, a little bit more that you know they could have used they everybody in the world that's against uh what we do is um they're they're trying to shut us down they're trying to you know they they want so badly for cwd to affect humans that uh they'll say and do anything to make that happen and that's that was what our concern was is that it could shut down uh three big industries you know the exotic industry whitetail and elk industry um because we all have susceptible species and uh, that just, we just couldn't let that stand. Sure. Talk to us a little bit about, if you don't mind expanding on the sales tax here in Texas. Well, the, and this started about, uh, it's this, this has been an ongoing thing. Every time it seems like we change state comptrollers, uh, they, they're looking for ways to find more money, more and more money into the, uh, the fund. And one of our members um, was notified that he had not been paying sales tax on the sale of a, tr a tremendous amount of exotics over the last few years. And um, we put in a call to their enforcement division. So I've, I've had an ongoing conversation with, uh, with the state comptroller's enforcement division. And 
they were not aware, the guy that I was talking to was not even aware that exotics were considered livestock in the agriculture code because he was he was enforcing and, and reading their regulations. And that's where the conflict is coming is we've got two different sets of uh, one, you know, one's policy and one's regulatory. And um, so right now we're in kind of a limbo state. Uh, we've uh, our, you know, the former Speaker of the House, Gib Lewis, uh, has been uh, helping us on one end of it. Um, and uh, we're going to, we've never wanted to really open up this agriculture code, Patrick, because there's a whole, I mean, it's a Pandora's box when you open that thing up. Like, there's all kinds of things that can happen. But what's going to wind up happening if we don't do something and fix it? You know, we keep kicking that can down the road. And years ago, the horse industry, you know, the, the, the it clearly states food and fiber. Animals are, are considered livestock or exempt from sales tax if they're used for food or fiber. Well, the horse people years ago were smart enough to get a uh, an exemption for their industry on the sales tax, and that was actually written into their code. And so that's what we're looking at trying to do. And we'll be, you know, we're gonna uh, we're we're calling on uh, several of our legislators are already aware of what we're what we're asking for. We've got a, a couple of them that I think will be on board with us on this. Um, and we're hoping that uh, that it's an easy fix, but you know, you never know. So that's kind of where we're at today. It's kind of back in limbo again. Uh, it's a gray area. And so our our member that was hit with this from the from the uh, comptroller's office, it's kind of on a simmering right now in the in the fire. So okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna click over to some more specific questions. Um, one is where can I find more information on raising exotic goats in captivity? I'm having a tro I'm having trouble with my survival rates. I don't know of the, any literature that's actually that's actually written down. I know that uh, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Mungle is our technical advisor, and she's probably one of the foremost authority on exotics. But I tell you, who probably is one of the best veterinarian sources for that is Dr. Pat O'Neill over at Purdue Nellis Vet Clinic. He's uh, he's kind of our go-to guy on exotics. Uh, he treats, he's almost entirely in the exotic uh, and whitetail, I should say, in the cervid business. And uh, he's he is a, an authority on, on the goat end of it as well. Uh, but I, like I said, Patrick, I don't know of any literature that's really, I'm sure there's probably some, I just don't know of the literature that would be out there. Now, we have an excellent uh, animal field guide, but, and it covers a lot of things, but I don't know about, you know, the, the specific question of survivability with, with those animals. I, I don't know. That would be an issue for that. I would think Dr. Pat would have to answer. So, uh, Charlie, this is we've got a lot of good specific questions coming in now, and I thank you for that. Um, and and for the person who was asking those questions, if you want us to get you in touch with Dr. Pat O'Neill, we can get you the phone number for sure. Um, next question is, um, and this is a pretty specific one as well. How do we overcome northern states from acquiring CWD status for fallow when fallow can't even get CWD? Well, that's a that's see that's a state by state issue, and that that battle has been fought on many battlefronts uh, in the North uh, for a long time. I know the the state of Wisconsin is one of those states that uh, absolutely requires uh, CWD certification to be able to move uh, any of their any exotic up there, and um, th again we we we've, we've talked to in our meetings our sector meetings patrick that you're, you've attended with us in washington uh we have talked about that specific problem and <clears throat> of uh and it's they'll, it's a state's rights issue it's a state's issue and so that state veterinarian um is the one that makes those requirements and and their commission just like our Texas Animal Health Commission sets those requirements and regulations. And uh, until we can change the mindset of that particular state veterinarian, um, I don't see how we can ever lift those requirements in individual states. Yeah, you know, Charlie, I might, I might direct um, 
some of that attention to the American Servant Alliance as well. Folks, the American mm -hmm. Alliance is, is a group, an organization made up of um, uh, all industry associations across the country. It's, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not an organization like TWA. <coughs> it is actually made up of representatives of all state associations and they, they cooperatively work together to, um, to try to affect change like this. And this might be one of the initiatives we kick, Charlie and I kick to the American Servant Alliance to see if state by state we can enter into um, compacts with other states to ensure that we, uh, the transport of, of fallow is, is allowed. So um, something ACA might be able to work on. Charlie, I've got to- Well, the fallow, fallow coming into Texas, I mean, we can bring fallow into Texas without uh, any certification uh, from, from that state. Uh, our, our Texas Animal Health Commission does allow that with health papers, um, TB and brucellosis tested. So they can come in uh, in here. Okay, perfect. Um, Charlie, the next question I have is, um, and, and this is a, probably the long-winded one, in the, in, in the future, where do you see this market going? How does it trend with traditional livestock? Is are, are exotic animals a good replacement supplement for traditional livestock? So you got a market question and you got a question that's kind of geared towards, um, can you supplement this or replace exotic animals uh, for traditional livestock? Well, in many instances, that has been done on, on, on several ranches. After, after my father died um, the, and the ranch, our ranch became uh, mine, um, I removed all the domestic livestock off of it. It went strictly to, uh, to the exotic side of it. And for a brief time, for 20 years, I raised, I, I, I was diversified with, uh, in the whitetail breeding end of it. And, um, to answer your question specifically, our, the exotic industry, the whitetail industry, uh, it will never replace, uh, domestic livestock. I mean, that's a, that's, that's the mainstay. That's what drives the train across the country, uh, is, is cattle, sheep, pork, things like that. Um, but I can tell you, I, I was able to make better profits on this ranch through exotics and through the sale of my whitetail than I ever was, uh, with, with the cattle. Um, and, and we weren't a huge cattle ranch. I mean, it was a cow calf operation. But uh, the exotics, I can run, I can run, for example, axis. I can run seven axis to every cow. Um, I can run three or four Gemsbach for every cow. And the prices on those Gemsbach are, are those axis, are, they're, they're, they're tremendously higher than what it is on, on cattle. And uh, so that's, now they're a little harder, you know, your death losses and things like that mount up a little faster than because they are wild animals. And uh, so I, I hope that answers the question. I, I certainly think it does. A follow up to that by the same gentleman was, um, do you see registries being set up for every or most exotics, specifically super exotics? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, I see um, us. And we've been requested, and we're, and we're looking at right now uh, two of those, and that would probably be uh, starting out with the uh, uh, kudu and sable, some of the, the, the higher end super exotics. Uh, we, the problem with that is you have a, you know, you have to establish your own foundation as far as uh, the, the the DNA on those animals. Uh, I know that we do have some uh, from some DNA sampling from from South Africa, but by and large, there's not enough information out there. Now, as far as the sheep and goats, uh, that one is going to be really, really tough because of the hybridization of a lot of these of a lot of these animals. But uh, the actual answer to that question on on setting up a, a registry is that the demand is it's being asked for. And, uh, you know, back uh, a year or so ago, the fallow and red deer registry were asked for. 
and EWA went out and we spent about fifteen thousand dollars developing the program that and everything. And and Patrick, it's going that that registry in the fallow end and the red deer end is just absolutely exploded. And uh, it has what it has done is brought prices, and not just on the registered animals, it has also brought pasture animal prices up to you know fallow that were a few years ago you could hardly give a fallow doe away and we were letting hunters shoot them for 50 bucks today those same pasture fallow are bringing anywhere from six to seven hundred dollars a piece which is uh you know that's 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 a pretty good price on a fallow doe and then for registered fallow uh it's it's i mean the, the sky's the limit on that the prices i mean if you've tried to buy uh, fallow from some of these boys that are into the fallow business. So you know what the prices they're getting on. Yes, sir. I was telling Lance Clawson I should have chose to shot a fallow a couple of years ago because <laughs> I think my my price for hunting on these on these big boys went way up. It the explosion. Oh yeah, it's just been tremendous. And y'all, it's a great thing to see as the executive director of the Texas Deer Association. We we look at we look at fallow and red deer and all other types of exotics as a supplement and a diversification for your business. It's in any business you want to diversify so that um, your risk is, your level of risk is lowered. And I think any diversification that a, that a captive ant, a captive breeder can have is, is a good thing for them. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just great to see what's happening in that stag and, and fallow market with the registries. And um, you know, we're, we're not, we're not as in tune with the, with the supers as you are, Charlie, but it's really enlightening to hear that, some of those animals might be getting a registry as well. I, I think the more animals we can get into those registries, the better. Um, one thing that Pete Moore, and I'll, I'll plug Pete here for a second, has always been consistent about is is um, the sanctity of the species. What are you guys doing in, at EWA to keep these animals pure to their normal species? Well, first off, if it's one of the endangered species, and that's what happened a few years ago when the when we were working on the three species, when we lost that exemption, uh, and th th it was really sad to see because a lot of the ranchers uh, they were dropping their their scimitar horns, for example, pennies on the dollar. You could do a scimitar horn hunt for about a thousand bucks on some of the biggest bulls out there, and the population went. We we did a census shortly after that, and it it dropped by 50 percent, and in some cases 60 percent uh, on the numbers of, of of animals, and uh, so a lot of people started turning those high those scimitar horns in uh, with with their with their gemsbok and uh, and crossbreeding hybridizing, and uh, they started uh, you know crossing addicts with with other things and it and it was it was sad to see and so outside of being illegal as well but uh anybody that's in this business that is going to have and put that kind of money into a, a, for example a gemsbok a scimitar horn or any others is certainly certainly not um going to going to crossbreed those things and and that's one of the things i guess it's the biggest problem we have when our new members come to us and they're wanting to know uh, they they buy a ranch and they want to throw some animals out there on it and they don't know exactly what to mix and match and they throw similar horns in with their gems box so uh, and that's one of the biggest hybridizations we have and so that's we we work feverishly trying to get those animals into a separate pasture or or whatever I mean you can run them together I do but in, in they're in different pastures. Okay, I, I have a I have a tough one that I'm going to throw at you now. Um, there has been an observation that um, chronic wasting disease rules and regulations have impacted some of those species. Um, have you seen a reduced interest in any exotic species that are classified as chronic wasting disease susceptible? The answer to that is yes. We have a lot of uh, a lot of our members um, that had huge numbers of elk and red deer, and psyca for that matter, are they they have totally either gotten out of the business or um, they're they're not moving any very little live movement anymore. Uh, so they're either hunting them out and not replacing them, um, 
and and it's sad to see because those are such viable industries, especially uh, when you're talking about red deer. Uh, there's a new movement on the red, far red deer, but I don't think it'll ever be as big as it used to be. I, I just I don't think it ever will be because of the the fact of, of CWD. And um, a lot of the guys have gotten out of totally away from any susceptible species. That includes whitetail, psyca, red deer, elk. And, um, and, and it really, it, it, it has hurt those industries. Okay. Um, and Charlie, listen, I, I appreciate the honesty on all these questions. So thank you. Um, I, I've got another real specific question that says, are there any formula for feral hogs versus exotics on a high fence place? I think what they're asking for is, are there any demographics that you can give on ratio to hogs to exotics? <laughs> Um, kill every hog you see and have none. That's, 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 that's my, that's my comment to that. I mean, um, you know, a few years ago, Patrick, we ran a hunting operation down in South Texas. Um, and that was one of the things I was going to mention now, and I'll get around to the hogs, but we, we actually bought, if you can believe this, we bought boar hogs and brought them in to the ranch and it was a high fence ranch and and uh we i'd buy a hundred boar hogs at a time and they would be the little hundred pounders little little bitty guys we put them on full feed and by hunting season by september october november those hogs were up to three four hundred pound hogs and i couldn't i couldn't raise enough of them uh by the end of the hunting season i was totally shot out on feral hogs so that was one of the good things, and we ran them right along those those hogs right along with our uh, with our whitetail operation and our exotic operation. So, and we, you know, outside of them eating a lot of feed, um, they that was the only detrimental thing of the whole thing. But uh, we we shot them out quickly. So that was that'd be my recommendation. There is just to get rid of every hog you see. Sure. You know, Charlie, I want to mention something just that you and I deal with in these advocacy conversations, especially at the federal level, about biosecurity. Um, folks, hogs are a, are a very big vector for probably one of the most dangerous classified vectors for foot and mouth disease in the United States. Um, while, while we think it is fun to shoot them, and it is certainly profitable to shoot them if you, if you have that hunter demographic that likes to shoot them, um, from a biosecurity standpoint, they are a risk for every major animal disease out there and, and even some really big brand name diseases like foot and mouth disease. Um, they really are a nuisance and they're more than a nuisance. They're a threat to a lot of our ways of life here in the United States. So I do appreciate the fact that they are profitable and I do appreciate the fact that hunters like to hunt them. But the truth of the matter is they are a vector for a lot of diseases that Charlie and I and others struggle with at the federal advocacy level, so and regulatory level. Well, Go ahead. and along that same line, Patrick is uh, uh, now the hogs that we brought in, we blood tested. They, they they were blood tested, so we moved them for brucellosis and and TB. We, they were tested, and so we knew that they were free of that. But you're right, the hogs uh, do carry their major carrier of the uh, fever tick, and. Uh, so they're having that's that's one of the reasons why that line down in South Texas is just it, it's going to be you know static line it's it's right. that and and a lot of the nail guy antelope that move around down there they they are vectors for the fever ticks and so uh, that's why I say kill everyone you see. Sure, um, Charlie, I've got another question for you, and and it it it, um, it deals with carrying capacity. Uh, it says. Can you talk a bit in terms of carrying capacity related to South Texas in terms of percentage of only exotics, super versus common, and deer versus exotics? So talk to us a little bit about um, habitat diversification and uh, carrying capacity, if you don't mind. Well, with and, and what I would say is you, a great source of, uh, of information is to find out from your uh, USDA office or what what the carrying capacity and it changes depending on the year um, you know here in the hill country on any you know our annual rainfall is about 26 inches per year and that's a good year um, with that you can run 
they they don't recommend running any more than about one uh, animal unit, which is a thousand pound cow and calf uh, per uh, per twenty five or thirty acres, and that changes in the drought times. That lowers and in the South Texas same way. When the in the good years, you know, South Texas had a uh, last couple of years has been abundant rainfall. Uh, you can certainly run more cow calf units than what you you could on a, a drought year and as i alluded to earlier in the presentation um you can run uh around seven axis seven fallow seven deer size species for every cattle cow unit you have um the supers the bigger they are obviously you don't run as many of them like the gemsbach you can run two to three of those per cow so i would find out what what the USDA recommends, they don't they don't have a, a guideline for exotics, but they uh, one of the things if you start seeing a browse line in your place, you know that you've got you've got way too many animals. And uh, most of the exotic ranches they probably run too many exotics on their place. But uh, as long as you're you know you're, as long as you're willing to bite the bullet, feed them, and keep uh, supplemental feed out. Uh, then you can you can certainly turn those you know, turn numbers a lot higher than what you normally would. So, you know, supplemental feed we call that rain 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 in a bag. Um, that's what you would have to do. But now if you want to if you want to be natural, you know, one animal I think in in South Texas, Al Brothers many many years ago, the old biologist, uh, they recommend about one I think one white tail per ten acres, something like that, and. A lot of our our guys that, and I know that on the ranch that I had, that our hunters wanted to see numbers. They wanted to see a lot of deer, and so we had a lot of deer, and there was nothing to see twenty, twenty five, thirty bucks at a feeder. Um, but the the downside of that was that we fed a lot of feed, but we had a lot of you know a lot of natural browse and stuff for them, so they never suffered. Um, but uh, USDA is the place to get your find out what the carrying capacity of your land is and and also your business plan what does your business plan say are you wanting to be more of a whitetail ranch with supplementing it with you know exotics for your hunters I know um, when we ran our hunting operation uh, we had our mainstay was our whitetail but I had other pastures because we found out early on that our hunters would come in for a three-day hunt and that's a typical of a, of a whitetail a hunting operation is three day hunt they'd come in and shoot their they'd shoot their buck that afternoon and they there was nothing else for them to do their buddies were still hunting the rest of the weekend and so they either left or they they just hung around the lodge when we put exotics out there uh it almost doubled our income because they shot their buck on the first afternoon and they wanted to go hunt something else the rest of the weekend so that that's how we ran our operation, but we we were primarily whitetail, so we kept our numbers. That's the whole thing: is keep your numbers in check. If you if you're a whitetail operation mainly, then you want to keep your low low numbers on your exotics. Okay, um, got kind of a longer question here. I'm going to go ahead and read it. Do you feel reproductive studies make a difference in the efforts to increase exotic servant numbers? And which deer species do you think studies should be geared towards in the coming future? to further this industry? Uh, yes, I do on the reproductive studies. I think that, um, you know, black buck, as you well know, uh, they have two babies every 13 months. And so they are very prolific and your numbers can get out of, get, really get out of whack. I would like to see more done. And, and there's, a, there's a big push right now uh, on pin raised axis and you see a lot of people out here that are uh, trying to uh, do them exactly the way the fall the way of the fallow but fallow that's a whole new an another animal most of those are very docile they're very easy to raise axis uh, on the other hand always on the launching pad and so you know bottle raising there's there's a trend to bottle raise these these axis and grow the biggest bucks, bucks that we can and uh, that's where I think I see the the demand there in the fallow industry, also in the uh, ibex, um, the Nubian ibex especially. 
those industries are are really starting to boom, and I think the future uh, with AI and in the uh, the AI work and uh, with fallow and and the AI work with uh, in the ibex industry and things like that, there it's it's going to be that, that's where the future is going to head. Sure, I'll I'll give kudos to 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 the guys that are trying to take traditional livestock reproductive systems and move them into um, the exotic and, and, and servant industries. I, I really applaud our industry for continuing to push the level of technology and scientific reproductive uh, technology specifically into these industries. I, I think it's good for the animals and I think it's definitely good for commerce to be able to push science into the conversation when we talk about reproductive assessments. So, um, Kudos to well, and also that hard road. I was going to say so also, Patrick, to the uh, the sable and kudu. I think you're going to see those same practices going that direction. And uh, a, a lot of times, what happens though is it's uh, it's kind of a uh, you you get a mass production and numbers. You know, it's always supply and demand. And uh, I think that the prices will level if they ever develop a good. Uh, AI program for these these other animals. I know the South Africans have tried it uh, and have been quite successful, but and they're doing it with the Cape buffalo as well. They're trying to reproduce those in, in quantities that makes them lucrative to have here in Texas. Charlie, you you, you mentioned the South Africans again. I'm going to put you on the spot because I've been asked it a couple times in conversations at the federal level. Um, what are the what are the what are the species on the bubble that we feel like we may get here in Texas that we previously haven't haven't seen yet? You know, I, I and, and in numbers, and I mean, um, I always get asked about rhinos. That's always there. Um, Cape buffalo are always there. What are the species that might be on the cusp that if somebody's really trying to get ahead of the curve and really trying to capitalize on that, what what are some of the species that they might be looking into? Well, obviously the uh, the, the uh, Zambian and the Namibian uh, sable; those are the those are the, some of the largest sable. Uh, here, here's the problem that we have, and FMD, foot and mouth disease. You alluded to that while ago in the hogs. Uh, it is it's very prevalent over in South Africa, and but there there is one region in Namibia that is foot and mouth disease free so that's if there's going to be any animals brought and they, there's a prohibition about bringing any ruminant animal uh hoofed animal uh into the united states it's it they, it just can't happen but what has to happen is they they have to go to a major quarantine facility which is one of those is san diego zoo uh the buyer of those animals can never own the original animal uh, he can certainly have the progeny of them, but uh, it's somewhere down the line. But the cost is going to be so tremendous. And, and I realize that to, to some of the guys that are doing this and wanting to do it, the cost is, is immaterial. Um, but probably the, those animals are going to have to be, it, it's, it's almost impossible to get those. Now, pachyderms and uh, the cattle end of it, um, like uh, the Cape buffalo, I know that there are some Cape buffalo that are, are going to be allowed to come in, but they're from a foot and mouth disease free uh, zone. And so uh, we'll see how that, that works out. But uh, th there's going to have to be a major, major uh, shutdown of, of foot and mouth in South Africa. And I don't know if they'll ever get a handle on that. Um, well, listen, I, um, it's been a pleasure talking to you, Charlie. And I, I want, I, I think we're out of question. Well, just had one pop across now that I said that. Um, if you don't mind, can you mention the seven species again? Somebody missed it and they were wanting to go back. And can you mention the seven species that might be um, added into the three species exemption? Okay, that's the uh, Barasinga, the Ells deer, the Red Lechewe, the Gravy's zebra, the Arabian oryx, the Bangtang, and the Gower. Perfect. Charlie, I, listen, I, I want to impress upon our, our, our listeners and our viewership that um, in all of these um, industry associations, um, 
like EWA and TDA, um, we are a three-pronged stool. We have auctions, we have an education component, and we have an advocacy component. And sometimes so many people uh, will put an emphasis on that auction piece. But the truth in the matter is, is um, the ability to sell animals exists not only in the auction arena, but also on your ranch through private treaties. It's really the other two legs of that stool that make these associations important. And I want to tell you that you guys at EWA do a phenomenal job at education and advocacy. And those two things are oftentimes far more important than that bright lights auction piece. And so um, I hope that our listeners today glean that. I hope that they um, really understand that, that EWA is so much more than just um, the sale of an exotic animal. It's, it's all of the pieces that go into making um, th these transactions possible through education and advocacy. So um, I'll let you have the last word. I know we're kind of running out of, on t running out of time, but I wanted to tell you, thank you very much for everything you guys do over there. And again, um, take the last word and take us home. Well, uh, we appreciate you as always, Patrick, you and the Texas Deer Association uh, for having us here. Also for the things that we work, do we, as you said, we do work together. And it's uh, it's very important that people understand that. And, and in many instances, we have a lot of cro crossover members. I know that I've got members in TDA. Uh, I'm a lifetime member of TDA, as are a, a lot of my members, and and vice versa. So it all works hand in glove. And and without their strength in numbers. And and so we may have different industries, but we're all fighting for the same thing. That's the ability to do what we do, and with the amount of regulations. Uh, but at the same time, keeping our animals safe. Well, Charlie, if, if anybody needs to more information, tell them where they go about EWA. Tell them how they get in contact with you. Go to our website, myewa.org, uh, and uh, you can find everything you need right there. Or call us. Call us at the office. Uh, we're open Monday through Friday, 830 to 430. Uh, my cell phone is always listed there. I answer that cell phone 24 seven and uh so if anybody wants to talk have a has a question uh since we've been sitting here i've had two questions come across by text messaging uh that is allowing us to uh they they want to know how to get in touch with trappers and traders so they can get some animals caught so we answer anything and everything so if we can't we'll find the person that can thank you patrick very much absolutely if you guys haven't been by his new office there in kerrville texas next time you're driving down i-10 be sure to stop and see the new EWA offices. Charlie, with that, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. And uh, folks, we will have this um, downloaded, recorded. I'm sure it'll be on the EWA website and on the Texas Deer Association website. Our organizations will post on social media and send out an email with the recording soon. With that, Charlie, thank you very much. We'll sign off. All right, senor. We'll see you at y'all's convention. Yes, sir. Bye-bye.